Shabbat Shalom, everybody. That's cool. I like that. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be up here uh, in front of my home congregation, my family, loved ones, and uh, my 10 new best friends, the TI Fellows. Welcome to Memphis. Um, this week's Parsha is Pinchas from the Book of Numbers. This Parsha includes a number of important stories of important stories and laws including God's reaction to the vengeance of Pinchas against the chieftain of one of the tribes of Israel, a census of the Jews after wandering in the desert for 40 years, but before going in the land of Israel, the apportionment of land among the tribes based on that census, the daughters of Salachaphad, try saying that five times fast, the daughters of Salachaphad, who appealed to Moses to let them inherit their father's apportioned land, God telling Moses that he, would, that he was not going to be able to enter the Holy Land and that Joshua would lead the Jews from then, from then on. And finally, many laws and specifications related to burnt offerings for festivals. In this Devar Torah, I will discuss the, impl- I will discuss the daughters of Salafachad and Joshua's succession of Moses and the implications that those stories have for our Jewish community and for what we are doing with the TI Fellowship. Before the Jews left Egypt, Hashem promised them each a plot each a plot of land in Israel. In this week's parsha, God instructs Moses to take a census of all the male Israelites over age 20 and to apportion the land of Israel proportionally based on the population. That was all fine and dandy until Salafahad's daughters came along. Salafahad, a wood gatherer who had died while the Jews were wandering in the desert, should have had a claim on a plot of land in Israel. However, Salafahad had no sons, only daughters who at that time had no property or inheritance rights. After Moses apportioned the land among the Jewish people, Salafachad's daughters came to Moses and asked that they be granted their father's land, which under existing law had gone to Salafachad's brothers. When Moses took the issue to God to ask what he wanted him to do, God ruled that Salafachad's daughters were justified in their claim and directed Moses to apply this rule to all other cases of inheritance going forward. This is quite significant because it is one of the first victories for a women's rights movement in written history. Pretty cool. (laughs) While Salafakad's daughters did take a huge step for women's rights, their actions are also representative of something much more mundane and yet still quite profound. They recognized that the status quo was going to result in a poor outcome for them. And instead of standing idly by, they took action to improve their situation. The other story in this parsha that I'd like to discuss is when God tells Moses that Joshua will succeed him as the leader of the Jewish people. After Moses spoke to God on behalf of Salafahad's daughters, we learn that Moses asked God for something for himself, that one of his sons could inherit his position as leader of the Jewish people, which apparently Moses wanted very badly. However, according to the Mishnah, Even though Moses' sons were very learned in Torah and would have been capable of leading the Jewish people, they did not go out of their way to teach others Torah, which Joshua was known to do. The Gomorrah speaks harshly of those who study Torah but did not teach it, and we can understand why that would be a a poor quality for the leader of the Jewish people, whose role it was to preserve and continue the nature and customs of the Jewish people. Therefore, God told Moses that he wanted Joshua, not one of Moses' sons, to be the next leader of the Jewish people. God God told Moses, and I quote, You shall lay your hand upon Joshua and present him before Eliezer, the Kohen, and before the entire congregation, and you shall command him in their presence. You shall bestow some of your majesty upon him so that all the congregation of the children of Israel will take heed. So God is essentially telling Moses, Sorry, but your son isn't good enough. Oh, oh yeah, and by the way, I still need you to install Joshua as a leader so that he will have credibility among the Jewish people. That's a pretty tall order. Uh, Pretty tall order from God. But here's the thing. Moses not only complies with God's commandment, he goes above and beyond to fulfill it. The Torah says that Moses did as the Lord had commanded him. He laid his hands upon him and commanded him, Joshua, in accordance with what the Lord had spoken to Moses. So 
that doesn't really tell me he went above and beyond. It kind of just said he you know, did his duty. Um, but when a question or need for clarification arises when studying Torah, most, uh, most Ashkenazi Jews consult the writings of Rashi, a legendary medieval Jewish scholar. You can think of him as a precursor to the modern day version, Wikipedia. Rashi gives us more insight into this passage, explaining that when the Torah states Moses laid both hands on Joshua, he went over and above what he had been commanded. Rashi says, for the Holy One, blessed, he, blessed is he, said to Moses, and you shall lay your hand upon him. But Moses did it with both hands. Moses fashioned him like a full and overflowing vessel, filling him with wisdom and abundance. So what is amazing to me about this passage is Moses' attitude. Even though Moses must have been devastated that his own son would not be able to continue his life's work, he goes above and beyond with a positive attitude with a positive attitude towards Joshua, convincing the rest of the Jewish people that God had made the right choice. So now that we've gone through the basics of this week's Parsha, I want to discuss how I think it applies to our lives today. About a year and a half ago, Rabbi Greenstein and Rabbi Grossman came to David Edelson, David Edelson Sam Fargetstein, and me, and told us that the Memphis Jewish community has a problem. Its youth are not moving back to Memphis after going away from college. This is a problem that we care deeply about, not only because we care about the larger Jewish community in Memphis, but quite frankly, because we want our friends that we grew up with and other Jews our age to live in Memphis with us. So after much analysis and discussion, we concluded that there are two primary reasons driving this dispersal, this diaspora, if you will, from the Jewish homeland of Memphis. Number one, there's a perception that there are no good jobs for young people in Memphis, and number two, that Memphis is not a fun place to live as a young adult. According to our theory, and luckily for Memphis, the main reasons why people were not moving back were problems of perception, not structural problems with Memphis itself. To combat these false perceptions, we created the TI, Temple Israel, Fellowship. In the fellowship, we have partnered with over 30 of Memphis's leading companies and nonprofits to provide high quality internships for TI Fellows over the summer. The TI Fellows are young Jews between the ages of 20 and 28. This year, we had approximately 40 appl applicants for the TI Fellowship from colleges all around the country. An independent committee of business and congregational leaders selected the 10 best applicants to be the inaugural class of TI Fellows who are all in the chapel tonight. Shabbat Shalom, guys. Actually, um, in addition to Shabbat Shalom, would you guys mind standing up so all of our uh, congregation can see who you are and wish you a Shabbat Shalom? So um, we're really happy to have you guys here. but. In addition to providing the internships, the, fellow, the fellowship houses all the fellows together in a cool apartment complex downtown and organizes all kinds of events around Memphis for the fellows, social, community service, cultural immersion, and professional development. Our hope is that through the fellowship, young Jews from Memphis and from around the country will realize that Memphis is not only a great place to start a career, but is also an incredible city to live in as a young adult. Finally, we hope, to show the, we hope to show the fellows how to incorporate Judaism into all aspects of their lives, professional, social, communal, and spiritual, so that they can find meaning and fulfillment in life after college. So I would like to think that we, being Rabbi Adam, David, Sam, and I, took a leaf out of Salaf Achad's daughter's book, and recognizing that the status quo was going to lead to a poor result took action that will hopefully improve the future Jewish community in Memphis. However, the fellowship is just the first step in changing young people's perception of Memphis. For the next step, I think we should take a lesson from Moses in this week's Parsha. Because Moses wants to ensure the continuity of the Jewish people, he maintains an incredibly positive attitude when installing the next generation of Jewish leaders. In order for us to do the same in Memphis, 
we need to have a positive attitude about our city. The TI fellows that I have spoken to, especially the ones that aren't from Memphis originally, are amazed at all the awesome stuff that there is to do here. They have a great attitude about Memphis. And I think Memphis is truly a gem, but at times I know we all forget that. We often forget to be thankful for all of the blessings we have in our lives, and especially those related to our city. If we recognize the good things about Memphis and don't seek out the bad, then our perception will become reality. Memphis has grit and grind, what we Jews tend to call chutzpah. Memphis has soul and history. And what's awesome is that the Jewish community has played and contributes to play a big part in that. We had Jews that owned the Beale Street clubs where blues music was born. We had Jews leading the civil rights movement from our own Rabbi Wax marching with Dr. King to my great uncle Marvin Ratner starting the South's, South's that's a tough word to say, first racially integrated law firm. The Jewish community continues to be one of Memphis's strongest selling points. Memphis is a place where it's common for families to have strong friendships with other families going back at least three generations, but also a place where we welcome newcomers with open arms. Memphis has great restaurants and music and basketball. Let's be thankful for what we have. If we all look at Memphis this way, then our positive perception will become a reality. As Moses showed us, positive thinking can make all the difference. Finally, I'd like to end with a story that embodies the lessons we can learn from Salafakad's daughters that I remember Rabbi Greenstein telling to my Sunday school class when I was just a very little kid. One morning, a man was walking down a beach that was covered in dying starfish. The tide the night before had been especially, especially strong and thousands of starfish had been washed up on the shore, too far up for them to make it back into the water by themselves. The man shook his head as he trudged along, thinking what a shame it was that all of those starfish would die there on the beach. But then he came upon a boy who was throwing the starfish back into the ocean as fast as he could. He was out of breath, and it was obvious that he had been at this task for a while. Son, the man said, you might as well quit. There are thousands of them. They are washed up all over the beach as far as you can see. There's no way you can make any sort of difference. And the boy didn't even pause in what he was doing. He kept bending and throwing and bending and throwing. But as he did, he spoke to the man. I can make a difference to this one and this one and this one. And the man thought and he knew the boy was right. Just like the little boy in the story, may we all find opportunities to make a difference in ways that are meaningful to us. May we have a positive attitude on the journey, and may we be thankful for the blessings we have. Shabbat shalom.